you look regusted. What's wrong with the world today? Uh, Dave's been yapping away with that owner over there for more than 20 minutes, Tech. I don't know why he's spending so much time. The car's only in here for a cooling system check. Well, that owner's on his way now, Steve. Let's hear what Dave has to say about the tie-up. Hi, Tech. Steve and I've got a cooling system to look into. I just spent some time telling the owner about the pressure cooling system and easing his mind about water loss due to overfilling. <laughs> How you can talk so long about something so simple as a cooling system is way past me, Dave. I don't know why you made such a fuss over it. If the system overheats, it's probably because the thermostat is busted. Or maybe the owner doesn't fill the radiator often enough. Well, har de har har. Just listen to the expert spout. I hate to disappoint you, Stevie, but if the thermostat is ever damaged, it's the fault of something else in the system. <laughs> Tech's absolutely right, Steve. Don't be so quick to blame the thermostat. Damage to a thermostat is generally the result of a cooling system condition. It's rarely the cause. Well, maybe so, and maybe not. I still think this is a routine job. Uh, tell me, Steve, what's the cooling system supposed to do? What's it supposed to do? Well, uh, everybody knows it's uh, supposed to cool the engine. Oh, fine. That'd just work out swell when the temperature outside drops to zero. I think you better let Dave spell out the purpose of the cooling system. Well, okay, I'm listening. <laughs> The cooling system does three jobs, Steve. It promotes quick and even engine warm-up. It maintains correct engine operating temperatures, regardless of driving and weather conditions. And last, it prevents any buildup of heat at critical points. If the engine runs too hot, for example, moving parts will get scored due to excessive friction and heat from overexpansion. So, maintaining proper operating temperatures is mighty important. If an engine runs too cold, the air-fuel mixture won't burn completely. Unburned fuel that gets by the rings washes oil off the cylinder walls. This causes greater wear. In addition, unburned fuel, together with products of combustion, contaminates the oil. Now, if the oil doesn't get hot enough to vaporize this contamination, plus the water formed by condensation, the crankcase ventilating system can't carry it off. So, sludge will form in the crankcase. This also prevents proper lubrication of the working parts. So when the cooling system functions properly and maintains an even operating engine temperature, it's a mighty important job. It's a big job too, Steve. That cooling system carries away enough heat to warm an average six-room house in winter when it's zero degrees outside. Wow, I didn't realize the engine made that much heat. Oh, sure. Combustion chamber temperatures alone run 3,000 to 4,500 degrees. Exhaust valves turn cherry red, and cylinder walls get as hot as 250 to 440 degrees. But that heat is absorbed by the coolant flowing through the water jacket. By water jacket, we mean the water passages around cylinders, valve seats, valve ports, and combustion chambers. From the cylinder head part of the water jacket, the water pump forces the heat-bearing coolant into the upper part of the pump housing, then through the thermostat housing and into the top tank of the radiator. Right there, the hot coolant is channeled into the radiator core, which consists of thin-walled water passages separated by air passages, spreading the water out over a larger surface and letting air pass through the core gets the heat transferred to that outside air. It's like pouring hot coffee from a deep cup to a saucer and blowing on it to cool it faster. So that's why the water's cooler when it reaches the bottom tank of the radiator. Yep. And the water pump recirculates the cooled water through the engine passages so it can absorb more heat. This coolant circulates as the engine runs. The fan and water pump both are run by the same fan belt driven by a pulley on the crankshaft. Said another way, the cooling system's like an endless conveyor belt. The coolant keeps on absorbing heat from the engine and carries it to the radiator, where the excess heat is dumped into the outside air. Okay, okay. You fellows have made it pretty clear. I'll admit I'm rusty on the subject of cooling systems. Hey, you got a lot to learn about thermostats, too. The thermostat? Shucks, it's just a valve. 
It opens when the engine's hot and closes when it's cold. Everybody knows that. There's a little more to it, Steve, believe me. You're right in calling it a heat-operated valve. It restricts circulation of the coolant when the engine's cold. That promotes a quicker warm-up, which happens to save on fuel. Specifically, with a cold engine, the thermostat is closed. This keeps the coolant circulating within the engine to provide uniform warm-up. When the engine gets up to operating temperature, the thermostat opens slightly. This permits some circulation through the radiator and provides the necessary cooling. Well, that I can follow. But what part of the thermostat does the work? Well, the controlling part is a metallic bellows, partly filled with a liquid and sealed in a partial vacuum. That vacuum holds the bellows compressed and the thermostat valve closed. As the engine warms up, rising coolant temperatures start to vaporize the liquid inside the bellows. This vaporization causes a pressure buildup inside the bellows and it expands, raising the valve off its seat. Uh, now I got you. When the engine cools, the gas inside the bellows cools and pressure is reduced. That contracts the bellows and closes the valve. That's the idea, Steve. Our engines, incidentally, use two types of thermostats, a choke and a bypass. All Plymouth and Dodge engines use the choke thermostat. So does the Chrysler V8. When closed, the choke thermostat prevents coolant flow to the radiator. But an internal bypass passage in the engine is always open. This permits coolant circulation through the water pump and back through the block. All DeSoto engines use the bypass thermostat. The main difference is that when the thermostat is fully open, the bypass passage is closed off and all the coolant flows through the radiator. This occurs, however, only when the thermostat is fully open. A very good, Dave. Now tell Steve something about the radiator pressure cap. Oh, yeah. The radiator pressure cap is used to pressurize the cooling system. The cap has a spring which holds the pressure valve against its seat in the base of the filler neck. A rubber gasket is used to make the seal leak-proof. An overflow tube in the pressurized system is connected to the filler neck so it enters above the pressure valve on the cap. In addition, there's a vacuum relief valve. This is a small weighted valve in the center of the pressure valve in the bottom of the cap. It seats against the rubber gasket. When there's no pressure in the system, the weighted valve hangs down in the open position. This lets atmospheric pressure enter the system, especially when the ignition's turned off and the system cools off. Without this valve, a partial vacuum would form in the cooling system when the coolant vapor is condensed. This could collapse the radiator hoses and the thin walls of the radiator core. Looks to me like that's a mighty important valve. That it is, Steve. Under ordinary driving, remember, there's no pressure buildup in the system. But driving in heavy traffic, extremely hot weather or steep hill climbing, well, the temperature increases, which causes the coolant to expand and some vapor will form. This forces the vacuum relief valve to close and pressurize the system. Pressure under those operating conditions will build up to about seven pounds. At that point, it begins to overcome the force of spring pressure in the cap and opens the pressure valve. When pressure levels off to seven pounds, the cap closes again. Any leaks in the cooling system, naturally, will wreck the efficiency of the pressure cap. But let's take time out for another kind of pressure. If somebody will please turn the record, we'll go into some other angles on this pressure part of the cooling story. We were talking about the pressure cap being designed to pressurize the system up to seven pounds under certain driving conditions. On most cars equipped with air conditioning, a stronger spring is used in the cap. So, pressure can go up as high as 14 pounds per square inch. Well, right about now, fellas, I need an explanation. Enough, all right. But why have a pressure cap at all? What good does it do? A uh, good question, my boy. Uh, tell Steve the advantages, Dave. Well, a pressurized cooling system provides a wider margin of safety between the ideal engine operating temperature and the boiling point of the coolant. Here's how that works. You know that water, around sea level, will boil at 212 degrees. 
On a 10,000 foot mountain, it will boil at 194 degrees because atmospheric pressure is lower at that altitude. Now, the boiling point can be raised by putting water under a greater than atmospheric pressure. In fact, each pound of pressure raises the boiling point about three degrees. At sea level, seven pounds would raise the boiling point to 233 degrees. Atop that 10,000 foot mountain, seven pounds would raise the boiling point to 215 degrees. Oh, so that's why my radiator doesn't boil over when I drive up a mountain like Pikes Peak. Right. The pressure radiator cap makes it possible by raising the boiling point. I can see the advantages now. But why have a cap going to 14 pounds pressure on air-conditioned cars? Oh, Steve, use your head. You know the condenser sits up in front of the radiator on air-conditioned cars? Well, that condenser is giving up heat units, which cook up the outside air being pulled through the radiator. It stands to reason that the radiator can't do as good a job if the air drawn through it has been heated by radiation from the condenser. Yeah, Tech, yeah, I see it now. So we maintain the margin of safety by raising the boiling point even higher. Incidentally, Steve, always remove a pressure cap carefully. Uh-oh. Will it blow up in my face? No, but you could get burned, my boy. Just turn the cap part way to the safety stop. That lets steam and hot air escape out through the overflow tube. Then you can remove the cap. And be especially careful when removing that cap after the engine stops, Steve. Right. You see, when the engine stops, circulation of coolant, as well as air, also stops. But residual heat in the engine continues to be conducted to the coolant. That causes a rapid rise in coolant temperature, which is often enough to boil the non-circulating coolant. Okay, I'm convinced. I'll watch it. Fine. Now, the best way to make sure the cooling system keeps doing its important job is by frequent checking. Look for leaks and keep the system filled to its proper level. And that doesn't mean fill it till it runs over, kid. Right. When the engine is cold, the coolant level should be at least one and a quarter inches below the base of the filler neck. This leaves room for expansion when the coolant warms up. What happens if the coolant level's right up to the bottom of the filler neck? A good part of it goes right out the overflow pipe, Steve, as soon as it warms up. Yeah, and that's what leads a lot of owners to think they've got a leak. They don't realize they can lose up to a pint and a half when the radiator's overfilled. Another thing that might give an owner a bum steer about the cooling system is a wrong reading on the temperature gauge. You're so right, Dave. We're using an electromagnetic water temperature gauge now, consisting of a dash unit and an engine unit. Now let's give Steve the details. Good idea. The dash unit, Steve, has two windings. One has a fixed magnetic field. The other has a variable magnetic field. The fixed magnetic winding is connected to ignition switch and to ground. It exerts a steady pull on the pointer to hold it to the cold position when the ignition is turned on. The variable magnetic winding is connected to ground through the engine unit. This exerts a pull on the gauge pointer toward the hot side, depending on the current it gets from the resistor in the engine unit. Now that engine unit has a flat disk that varies its electrical resistance with changes in temperature. Resistance is high when the coolant is cold and low when the coolant gets warm. Right. So when engine temperature rises, the engine unit's resistance drops. That lets more current flow through the variable field in the dash unit. This pulls the gauge pointer to the hot side. When coolant temperature drops, resistance increases, and the fixed magnetic winding pulls the pointer the other way. Well, that's easy enough to understand, but how's a guy going to go about checking it? You just check the wires first to see if they're worn, frayed, or broken. Then clean the terminals at the dash and the engine units. Also, check battery voltage. If these points check out okay, put a reliable thermometer in the top tank of the radiator. Then you can check the gauge readings against the thermometer. 
The cold mark on the gauge stands for temperatures up to about 100 degrees. The start of the normal bar is about 150 degrees. The center of the normal bar is about 180 degrees. You'll find that gauge calibration nicely covered in this reference book, Steve. Okay, Tech. I'll be sure to look it over. Here's something else. Dirt and rust are great enemies of the cooling system. They not only cut down its efficiency, but they can clog the radiator and restrict circulation. So check the color and feel of the coolant. If it looks rusty and you can feel heavy particles in suspension, chances are the system should be cleaned. But even this check isn't always reliable. You're so right, Dave. It's much better to clean and flush the system twice a year, every spring and fall. Details on draining, cleaning, reverse flushing, and refilling the system are covered in this reference book. Okay. Any other service tips? Well, keeping antifreeze in more than one season isn't good, because the inhibitors used in the solution lose their effectiveness. So, even though a hydrometer shows the solution will protect against freeze-up, there's no way to check the strength of the rust and corrosion protection. I'll keep it in mind so I can remind our owners. Fine. And remind them to watch the temperature gauge for signs of overheating. Also tell them to have the coolant level checked each time they gas up. On engines you check, look for external signs of coolant leakage. It's easy to spot because it leaves a trace of rust or lime at the leakage point. Quite often, tightening hose clamps will stop leaks at hose connections. Replace wire clamps that may be loose. And if the hoses are cracked or feel soft, play it safe and replace them. Leaks around head gaskets can be corrected by tightening the cylinder head cap screws on all V8 engines to 85 foot-pounds torque. Swell. Well, I gotta admit, I know a lot more about the cooling system now. You should, Steve. Dave is one of the best in the business. And if you and all our mechanics Keep a watchful eye on the cooling system. Our customers will continue to enjoy the trouble-free performance designed into our product. It's up to all of us to see to that.